We will now continue with our discussion on energy by discussing an all-important concept, the conservation of energy. What does conservation of energy mean? Now, in Unit 1, we talked about the conservation of momentum. I hope you remember that concept. Well, we said in a closed system, the total momentum of the system remain unchanged. Momentum can be transferred from one object to the other, but the total momentum remain unchanged. In the same way, universe is a hub of energy. In fact, what is this universe? I told you about this uh, some other time. The universe is a great big port of energy. And energy can be transferred from one form to another. You and I are some versions of that energy, some blimp of energy in that big port of energy in the universe. The total energy is a constant. Nothing gets added to it, nothing gets removed from it. But energy continuously changes from one form to another. Right? That is the essence of conservation of energy. Now, in the classroom situation, let me take a small example to talk about it. Now, as a ball is taken up to the top of a stairs, suppose you have a ball and you take it up to the uh, top of a stairs, what happens? You are doing work on the ball to increase its potential energy. Is that right? Its potential energy increases because you are doing work on it to raise it. So here I have a, at the bottom of the stairs, its potential energy is zero. You keep climbing with it, means you are racing it. Now suppose, I'm just giving you a figure without calculation. Suppose at the top of the stairs, its potential energy is 50 joules. So you did 50 joules of work, to reach the top of the stairs. Now, let the potential energy at the top is U equal to 50 joules. All right? The potential energy there is 50 joules. Since it has no speed, now you took it there and kept it at the top of the stairs. It has no kinetic energy. It has no speed. Now, this is not sped, but speed. Now, since it has no speed at this position, its kinetic energy K is zero. So what is the total energy at that position? The total energy of the ball at the top of the stairs is 50 plus zero. That is potential energy plus kinetic energy equal to 50 joules. Okay, now what happens if the ball is now rolled down the ramp? If you now allow this ball to roll down and come here, what happens? Now this is where energy change occurs. You can see the potential energy is going to be converted to kinetic energy. All the potential energy it has at the top becomes kinetic energy at the bottom. See, once it reaches the bottom, it comes with a good speed. Where did it get the speed from? Well, the speed it acquired because it had an original potential energy. Now, kinetic energy at the bottom, all that potential energy, all this 50 joules, now becomes kinetic energy. So, its kinetic energy is 50 joules. And that will be one half mv squared. Now, so at the bottom of the stairs, the kinetic energy is 50 joules. What is the potential energy when it comes back to the bottom? At the ground level, the potential energy is zero. So what is the total energy at the bottom of the stairs? The total energy is potential energy plus kinetic energy, that is again 50 joules. Now that means no matter where this ball is, that total energy 50 joules is going to be a constant. But the potential energy can get transferred to kinetic energy, 
kinetic energy can get transferred to potential energy but the total energy will not change as the ball rolls down you can see if you keep the ball at a position like this when it comes here it will have both potential energy and kinetic energy and if you add the potential energy and the kinetic energy that will also be 50 joules. The conservation of energy, the conversion of energy from one form to another happens all the time in the universe. In fact, life is possible on the earth because energy from the sun is converted to many, many, many other forms. Now, where do we get the electrical energy from? The origin of the electrical energy that we use here is the energy from the sun, right? Yes, that's right. The source of all the energy on the earth is the energy from the sun. Now, the total energy in the universe always remains a constant. It never gets taken away, it never gets added to it. The total energy always remains a constant. And this principle is called the principle of conservation of energy. That's an all-important law in physics. Now, the law goes like this in a closed system. Energy gets converted from one form to another, but the total energy in the system always remains a constant. Life on Earth is made possible because of energy conversions and energy flow. The cycle of work and energy is the best way to understand the energy cycle. All right, we'll talk about the cycle of work and energy. When you do work on something, you give it energy. Is that right? Now, we, the, we see this all the time. Have you seen somebody uh, splitting wood, take the axe and raise it to a height, give the axe potential energy and bring it down to the wood, where the potential energy becomes kinetic energy. The work you do, you see, the, the food we eat gives us energy and the energy we have we can do work with. And when we do work, we can give energy to other objects. And those objects can then do work. Look at that. The conversion of energy into work and work into energy is a continuous process that goes on in this universe. And that's a beautiful process. And that is what keeps us all going. Right? Alright. I hope uh, this is an interesting concept for you to think about. Now, in turn... Objects that have energy will do work on something else and the energy cycle will continue. Alright, let's do a lab to test the conservation of energy. Let's continue. We will now talk about the different forms of energy. I told you this world is brimming with energy. What are the different forms of energy that we are used to? Can you tell me some different forms of energy? We talked about two forms of energy already here. Potential energy and kinetic energy. And these forms of energy is called the mechanical energy. Now, when a flywheel rotates, it has mechanical energy. So this is the familiar form of energy that we associate with machines. When your car engine works, you can see a lot of things will be moving. And the motion energy, that is a kind of mechanical energy. So potential energy and kinetic energy are both mechanical energy. Now kinetic energy of a moving train Potential energy of a compressed spring or a stretched spring. You know that if you compress a spring or stretch a spring, it has potential energy because it is capable of doing work. And all these are examples of mechanical energy. Well, 
Another most important type of energy is chemical energy. Chemical energy is the energy associated with chemical reactions. Whenever chemical reactions occur, either energy gets released or energy gets absorbed. Energy is released in one form of chemical reaction known as oxidation. You see, when hydrogen and oxygen combine to form water, a large amount of energy is given out. In fact, if you, if you have large amounts of hydrogen, we can produce large quantities of energy very cheap. In fact, that is what we are now trying to do, produce cars that will run on hydrogen, right? Now, when substances burn, they combine with oxygen in the air, releasing energy. If you burn wood or coal, the process is the substance will combine with oxygen and that chemical reaction will release energy. Now, energy is locked up in wood and coal and so on when you burn it. In other words, when the substance combines with oxygen, that locked up energy gets released. Now, don't think that we are producing energy. We are not producing energy. We are only converting energy from one form to another when you burn coal or wood. So burning wood can be represented, look at this, wood plus oxygen. Now, when wood combines with oxygen, what are the things that are produced? Carbon dioxide is produced. Anything when it burns, one byproduct is carbon dioxide. And water, that is harmless, and a lot of energy. This is the equation, we call it the chemical equation. Wood reacting with oxygen produces carbon dioxide, water and energy, large amount of energy. The locked up energy in wood gets released and this process is called combustion. Any process where the internal locked up energy is released you see, in your car, you pour fuel, gasoline, into your car. Now, inside the engine, gasoline and air is mixed, and that mixture is burned. In fact, what happens in, inside your car is combustion. And as a result of combustion, what are the things that are formed? There are a lot of carbon dioxide, water, and a lot of energy. So, it is the same kind of equation. So, what is combustion? Combustion is when the substance combined with oxygen releasing the locked up energy inside the substance. In photosynthesis, what is photosynthesis? Plants use up energy from the sun and water from the soil to manufacture their food. In fact, their food then becomes the plant material. Plants grow by manufacturing their food. Now they use energy from the sun, water from the soil, and carbon dioxide from the air. You see, a lot of carbon dioxide that is released into air as a result of combustion are used up by plants to manufacture their food. Right? So that process is called photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. Plants use energy from the sun to rearrange carbon dioxide and water molecules to form plant materials. Plants grow by producing plant materials and oxygen. During that process, plants release a lot of oxygen. And that's the reason why Planting trees and shrubs around your home is good for you. It produces a lot of oxygen. It consumes, it consumes a lot of carbon dioxide and releases oxygen. So look at the equation there for photosynthesis. Energy plus carbon dioxide plus water. Plants use energy from the sun 
carbon dioxide from the air, water from the soil, and it produces plants, materials, and oxygen. All right? Now, this is nature's balance. We pollute the air, plants clean it up. So, uh, plant a lot more trees so that they can do a better job. Now, this is part of the energy cycle in nature. Energy used in photosynthesis is released during combustion. You see, during photosynthesis, plants receive or absorb energy from the sun, and that energy is locked up in the plants. And when we burn plant materials, or when we allow combustion to take place, that locked up energy is released. So this is the part of the energy cycle in nature. Chemical energy is a kind of potential energy. You see, any, any energy that can be released from locked up position is actually potential energy. Chemical energy is kind of potential energy that is stored and later released during the chemical action. Now, plants use of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Look at that. Carbon dioxide is absorbed and water is absorbed and sunlight is absorbed. It produces sugar. That is what becomes plant material, uh, cellulose. So, sugar and oxygen which is released to the surroundings. And the reverse process occurs uh, in animals. What do we do? We take in oxygen and the respiration process that happens in our body, we manufacture, we take in food and oxygen and the combustion inside our body produces carbon dioxide. You see, the reverse process happens in animals. The sugar molecules from the food we eat combines with oxygen that we breathe, producing energy. You see, how much energy do we have? We go around and do a lot of work every day. Where do we get all that energy from? That energy we get from combustion of the food that we eat with oxygen. You see? And the food we eat is broken down into sugar molecules. And these sugar molecules combined with oxygen, producing energy, carbon dioxide, and water. So look at the equation. Sugar plus oxygen is carbon dioxide plus water plus energy. This is exactly opposite of what happens in plants. Now this process balances the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But our activities have piled up so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that plants alone cannot clean it up. We need to have our own initiative to clean up the air, to make the planet green. So that movement is very important. I hope you take that seriously. Now think of some of the ways this balance is disrupted by human activity and the contribution that makes to global warming. Again, if you want to write a paper on it, I will treat it as an extra credit. All right? So the amount of work, I want you to do as much as possible in this course. I'm not requiring you to do that, but if you want to do it, that will be an extra credit. So think of some of the ways this balance is disrupted by our actions and the contribution that makes to the global warming. Let's now talk about fossil fuels. What are fossil fuels? Fossils are things that are buried and kept uh, away, hidden from us for a very long time. Substances that release energy due to combustion are called fuels. Any material that combines with oxygen in the process of combustion that releases energy is a fuel. Petroleum is a fuel. Wood is a fuel. Coal is fuel. 
and food we eat is a fuel for us. Now fossil fuels are formed from fossilized animals and plants that were dead and buried millions of years ago. Now oil and coal are two major sources of fuel we have at present and they are both produced from fossilized animals and plants. Let's talk briefly on coal. Now coal, how is coal, coal formed? Now the energy in coal comes from the energy stored by plants that lived uh, hundreds of millions of years ago when the earth was partly covered with swampy forest. Millions and millions of years ago the earth was covered with swampy forest. Now, these swamps were buried and covered by layers of water and dirt as a result of millions and millions of years of change on the surface of the earth. Now, when you pile up mud and dirt on top of all these dead plants, the pressure increases and the temperature also increases. What happens as a result is those dead plants, remember there are millions and trillions of tons of those, are actually cooked underneath. And as a result of millions of years of this increased temperature and pressure, they get pressed and cooked and they get transformed into what we call today coal. So coal is a material that has transformed in years and years of subjected to this great pressure and temperature of plants that lived millions, hundreds of millions of years ago. And now you can see dirt and everything piled up and the pressure and temperature increased and this layer got pressed and compressed and cooked became coal. There you got the coal. And now what you have on top of that you got a big layer of the earth's surface. So in many places, if you want to get to that coal, you got to dig down and go into a mile, two mile or three mile down to the surface of the earth. And that is what a lot of our coal miners do these days. Look at the hard work they do. And sometimes they get killed because of the poor safety conditions in the mines. Now, the United States produces one-fifth of the coal produced in the world. You can see, you see, producing coal is not a very easy task. Going down underground and getting this precious fuel out is a very tedious job, and we lose a lot of life in the process. Coal is used to generate more than half of all the electricity produced in the United States. Besides electric utility companies, industries and businesses with their own power plants use coal to generate electricity. You can see it's used widely. Now power plants burn coal to make steam. Actually electricity is produced by turning a big coil of wire called a turbine inside a magnetic field. You need tremendous amount of energy to turn it. When you turn a turbine inside a magnetic field, it generates electricity. Now, let me show you a small... Now, I have a coil of wire over here. This is a coil of wire. And instead of rotating the one, the coil of wire, I'm going to move a magnet. Now, this is the magnet I'm holding. Now, watch what happens to the meter. This is a meter that would detect electricity flowing in this wire. See what happens when I move the magnet. Tell me what is happening. Well, this process produces an electric current. So, in a generating, electricity generating plant, 
great big coils like this are rotated inside a magnetic field or great big magnets are rotated inside a coil and that will generate electricity and we need a lot of energy to do that so what is happening is we we use coal to boil water and the steam that is generated is injected by very fine nozzles onto the turbine the turbine will rotate see in order to rotate the turbine you need energy and the steam will supply that energy and that is how electricity is produced so the steam turns turbines which generate electricity when coal is burned as fuel it gives off carbon dioxide which is the, the main greenhouse gas and is linked with global warming burning coal also produces other emissions such as sulfur nitrogen dioxide and mercury that can pollute air and water so we need energy all of us need electricity is that right that means we need to burn coal but burning coal and producing electricity for us is going to throw away all these pollutants into air that means we are making the environment unsafe for us so one of the things that you need to learn as a result of that we need to learn to conserve our energy consumption if everybody in the united states cut down their consumption by 10 percent which is not difficult do you know that our environment can be protected of thousands of millions of tons of carbon dioxide yes it can be so that's the reason why i told you in one of the labs earlier think of some of the ways you can conserve and save energy all right now petroleum another fossil fuel where does petroleum come from petroleum like coal is formed from the decayed remains of prehistoric marine animals and terrestrial plants in fact most of the petroleum that we get are from fossilized animals now over many centuries this organic matter mixed with mud is buried under thick sedimentary layers of materials subjected to great pressure and temperature and is systematically being cooked and transformed into oil the resulting high levels of heat and pressure cause the remains to change into what we now call crude oil and you can see how expensive and how demanding what demand that this have now a barrel of crude oil is now selling for 85 dollars do you know that about 20 years ago it used to sell for 22 dollars and now it is selling at 85 dollars look at the need for conservation all right so petroleum is a hydrocarbon it gives out large amounts of energy when it undergoes combustion when it combines with oxygen and is burned when it undergoes combustion it gives off a large amount of energy or the lot of energy in it is released and we use it to run our cars to run our trains to run our industries you see but in the process it has also a lot of unwelcome byproducts which fouls up our environment but burning oil receive, uh, releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere which is the prime contributor towards global warming oil reserves are not replenishable now one day these oil reserves are going to run out where are we going to go for our energy then now isn't it wise for us to start thinking about it now i talked about hydrogen as a source of fuel but we are not there yet we are not ready to use hydrogen as a fuel at in massive scale we need to find alternative 
to fossil fuels. And one of the ways is, again I emphasize, you know in this, in this uh, course, I will keep on telling you this, the need for conservation. You see, you learn to drive smaller cars. You go to Europe and other countries, you can see the cars are very small. You rarely find great big cars like American roads. In America, we are so used to luxury. You see, luxury is expensive. Uh, people will say, well, I can afford it. Well, yes, you can afford it, but somebody else cannot afford it, and the environment belongs to all of us. That means we have a collective responsibility to protect it. Is that right? Okay. Now, in order to sustain our civilization and cleaner environment, we need to conserve energy and look for alternative and renewable sources of energy. Well, we have been looking for it, we have been working on it, and we are gradually succeeding. Well, we might get there one day. Another kind of energy is the radiant energy. All the energy that we get from the sun is radiant energy. Well, the origin of all our energy source is the radiant energy from the sun. Radiation from the sun reaches in a wide spectrum of energy called electromagnetic spectrum. You see, electromagnetic waves or electromagnetic radiation is actually given off by objects at every temperature. This object is will give off electromagnetic radiation. I am giving off electromagnetic radiation. But what's the difference between the electromagnetic radiation that I give off, this one gives off, and the sun gives off? They are really all the same type and they differ in what is called wavelength and frequency. We'll talk about it. So, the energy waves are characterized by wavelength and frequency. Now, what is a wave? A wave has a, wave has a crest and a trough. All right, let me try and draw that for you. Now, here I have a wave. This wave has wavelength. Now look at another wave, a shorter wave, a still shorter wave, a still shorter wave. So, electromagnetic radiations consist of a large spectrum of waves. Now, some of them are very long, kilometers long. The length of a wave is a crest and a trough together. So this is one full wave of a very long wave. This is one full wave of a short wave. So a wave has a wavelength. See, this is one full wavelength for that wave. Now, the wave I am giving off, the radiation I am giving off is a very long wave. It's called infrared. And there are even longer waves, radio waves. You see, this object at the room temperature is actually giving off radio waves. Radio waves are very long, about a kilometer long. You see? And then infrared are heat rays. And as you come shorter, the visible light comes from the sun, it's still shorter. Then other radiations like X-rays, gamma rays, they are still shorter. So I want you to understand and make a note of this. The electromagnetic radiations that are emitted by objects. Objects at all temperatures emit electromagnetic radiations. And they, are, they consist of very long waves to very short waves. Now, depending on the wavelength, the properties of these radiations will differ. All right? Okay, let's continue now. So, here we have one type of wave. This is the wavelength that we call lambda. That's the long wave. When the wave is very long, its frequency is small. 
The frequency means the number of waves produced per second. That's the frequency. When the waves are very long, only a few waves are produced a second. So a very long wave has very low frequency. Now, short waves, you see the wavelength is short. Short waves are very high frequency. Now, the energy of a wave depends on the frequency. If the frequency is low, the energy is low. The frequency is high, the energy is high. That's how the energy is determined of a now, high frequency wave carry more energy. Now here I have a picture of all the electromagnetic radiation. Now look at this picture, what are electromagnetic radiation? At the very long wavelength, you have radio waves, and they are, they are about a kilometer long. You can see uh, about, well, about a kilometer long. And these wavelengths are given in nanometer. You know what a nanometer is? A billionth of a meter. As you come down to infrared, I told you what infrared are. Infrared are heat rays, and they are about 10 nanometers long. Now, come down, you have visible light, and look at the visible light. Visible light is made up of so many colors, and each color has a different wavelength. You see, each color has a different wavelength and frequency. And after you got ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays, they are very short waves and very high energy waves. So the electromagnetic radiation, all this radiation is actually coming from the sun. When you heat this rod, this rod will emit all kinds of radiation. All right? Now, visible light is a collection of over 3,000 waves, ranging from red at the long. You see, visible light is a collection of over 3,000 waves, ranging from red on the right end at the long wavelength end to violet at the short wavelength. So, red is very long waves in the visible light and violet are short waves in the visible That can be used to do this, uh, this work. That means many forms of energy can be converted to electrical energy. Electrical energy is produced by turning huge turbines. So those coils of wire are not small like the one I showed you. They are very huge. Because we need to produce power at a very large scale. Huge turbines causing electric and magnetic fields to interrupt. So that is why we rotate a, a coil of wire in a magnetic field. It is the interaction between the electric field and the magnetic field that produces the electric current. Now, this is a picture of a turbine. You can see how it is constructed. It is constructed in such a way that steam injected onto this can rotate it. So this is a steam turbine. Now in most commercial power plants, the turbines are turned by using heat generated by burning coal or oil. It is the pressure of the steam that rotates the turbine. Now, in most coal-fired power plants, chunks of coal are crushed into fine powder and are fed into a combustion unit. You know what a combustion unit is? A unit where coal will undergo chemical action with oxygen, releasing that lot of energy. That is the combustion unit. Then heat from the burning coal is used to generate steam that is used to spin one or more turbines to produce electricity. In a normal generating plant, there will be many of these turbines working at the same time. 
Now, here is an old powered generating station, and you can see the amount of coal that is used by one coal generating plant. Now, burning coal and oil releases carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. I know I told you this once, but I keep on repeating it because.